Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 22. The Helicopter Supervisor. This is the next instalment of our Pernicious PhD Supervisor series and the literature I investigated this week explored organisational culture, human resource management, but also crisis management. And this literature can be a little bit boring and a little bit banal, but it was able to resonate when I placed the frame of higher education studies and particularly critical university studies around this literature. So what we're going to do once more is we're going to start with the concept and the model of the helicopter supervisor. We're going to walk that concept around so you can recognise the characteristics. But we do not stay in despair, dear friends, no. Instead, we take that model, we take it on the chin, we understand it, and then we provide five strategies to mitigate and manage the helicopter supervisor. Now, the other important bit of this post this week is this model moves around a bit. It moves outside of uh, PhD programs as well. So you will come across helicopter bosses, <laughs> helicopter deans and helicopter co-workers. You will confront this model. Now, I've had a helicopter dean in my career when I was a head of school and you'll hear more about that shortly but I want to start with the helicopter supervisor noting the generalizability of this model okay so the helicopter supervisor leaves students alone most of the time and then with no notice at all swoops down lands and creates absolute havoc so this Sudden landing is accompanied by panic, anger, shame, blame. And all of this diverts students' plans, actions and aims, diverting them from a considered and rational pathway, the best way for learning, the best way for research, the best way for life, and moves the student from rational and logical pathways to a chaotic irrational mess. <laughs> so the best relationships between students and supervisors, indeed the best relationships between humans, are planned, predictable, supportive, nurturing, compassionate and understanding. But the helicopter supervisor is different. The student is neglected, with very little support from the supervisor at all. So the student almost all of the time is on their own. And then something happens. And the supervisor drills down to see the student in an absolute panic. So interrupts and intervenes. Now, this is the important bit. The reason for the supervisor's dire in intervention in the student's life is not in the student's interests. So the reason that the supervisor has suddenly landed in a student's life has nothing to do with the student at all. Instead, it is caused because something is about to impact on the supervisor. Absolutely crucial. So the helicopter supervisor brings fear, brings confusion because they create instability. So helicopters are absolutely irresponsible. They're shallow, they are not in control of their own behavior, they disconnect, and at any moment in time, they reconnect with anger and rage and shame and blame. So helicopter supervisors, like helicopter managers more generally, emerge from an unstructured and unregulated workplace. This is important. So supervisors feel like they're not accountable to anybody. There are no rules, there's no policies or procedures that can impact on them. Basically, they're Leonard Skinner's free bird man. 
They can do what they like. They have no parameters or control on their behavior. So this means that PhD students are neglected, certainly. They're abused frequently. So the helicopter supervisor thinks they can treat students as they please without any consequences. So they emerge from universities that have a disrespect of supervisory or advisor training because they assume that they know what they're doing and we all know what happens next. They assume they know what they're doing until it's found out, often in a moment of crisis, that they've got no idea what they're doing. So let's get into this. This is the important bit. The wake-up call for the helicopter supervisors, these wake-up calls are catastrophic. Let me list them. So we see an academic integrity breach, a research integrity breach, fabrication of data, sloppy data collection, sloppy supervisory theoretical engagement. Often the theory is pitched too low for the student. We see a flawed methodology. At its worst, we see sexual assault, we see sexual harassment, and we certainly see bullying. And when this absence, these problems are suddenly found out, and the helicopter supervisor lands, or indeed they crash back into the students' live, lives, then it's an absolute catastrophe. Okay, so helicopters do not know they are helicopters. <laughs> always a problem because they hide behind titles or funding or their publications and they particularly hide behind their supposed achievements. They have no sense about how much they have hurt people for those achievements. They've also got no sense how much other people have done to create those achievements. Yeah. So they neglect, they ignore and they expect what a combination. And when something goes wrong from this neglect, all this ignorance, all this expectation, and it always does, then they blame everybody else except themselves. And there's huge, catastrophic damage to the people around them. Okay, so the worst helicopter supervisors offer no guidance at all, so they're completely hands off, but then they slam down to the ground with huge expectations. So in the sciences, the helicopter supervisors are incredibly dangerous. There's no other word I can use except dangerous. They let their students go working in the lab, often without sufficient training on quite intricate, delicate equipment. You can see what's going to go on there. And they're also lazy in preparation of their articles. So they act as the freeloading postdoc on publications and add themselves to articles and data sets that they have not checked. And then what happens is they get caught out by the referees or the peer reviewers of the journal. They show, the peer reviewers show, the numbers have been fudged, things are not quite right and there appears some sort of fabrication of a data set. So it's hands off until an absolute panic where public humiliation could emerge. That's in the sciences. In the humanities, it manifests a bit differently. The student is left to their own devices, so hello Deirdre, there's the library, see you in three years. But that doesn't work anymore because there's a milestone event where the supervisor is called out for a lack of attention and a lack of progress. And the proxy we see in the high humanities in particular is that the reading level or the theoretical level of the student is far too low. We've got a lot of fascinating, brilliant, incredible things happening in the humanities at the moment, but it has this profound honesty to it at the moment. Who's done the reading? Who hasn't? Who's seeing this new research? Who's not? And the truth of that reality of who's working and who's not is starting to manifest. And you can see it in student doctorates, particularly at the pitch of the PhD. And of course, so therefore, once more, embarrassment is triggered by this bad behaviour. So they don't care about the student at all 
until they are about to be embarrassed for something that the student did or didn't do, didn't know what to do. And at that point, the helicopter lands and it's havoc. So helicopters are very, very dangerous to universities. They're dangerous to students. They're actually very dangerous to universities. Helicopter researchers, teachers, supervisors, managers, leaders create and allow to happen difference there they create but they also allow to happen a series of scandals in our organizations so this is when we start to see plagiarism scandals fabrication of data sets research misconduct sexual misconduct misappropriation of funds the really serious stuff that can end up with you being in jail so the famous cases around the world were caused or allowed to happen, and they're different, caused or allowed to happen by helicopter supervisors or helicopter supervisors of helicopter supervisors. Therefore, you are going to meet them in your career and they are incredibly dangerous. They will be unpredictable in their moods. They'll sometimes be incredibly charming, but mostly they will be very aggressive. And at this point, they are rarely called out by our universities because our universities are under-regulated at the moment. But as a former dean, I used to know when we had a helicopter supervisor because I saw a clustering of particular proxies and characteristics. So when I saw a clustering of attrition from the program, so a lot of students are leaving, from a particular supervisor, but secondly, mental health issues, severe mental health issues emerging from students too. I would then see a third, which is students would suspend or intermit for a program continually. So you would see a high level of suspension as well. And finally, and this was always the cruncher, so I'd look for those three, but the final one was key, and that is the students expressed overtly and used the word fear. They are frightened of their supervisor. The moment I hear frightened, I know we've either got a predator or we've got a helicopter, right? So these situations are happening over and over and over again. And helicopter supervisors are allowed to supervise over and over again because the PhD supervisor, the PhD advisor, in the North American system, we don't have any job specifications or a position description for a PhD supervisor. And remember, why it's so dangerous is that these supervisors are frequently left alone with students without any regulation or regular assessment of what they're doing. Okay, therefore, serious isn't it yeah so therefore to get you out of this situation indeed hopefully to stop you getting into the problem in the first place let's provide the five strategies to handle the helicopter supervisor and and these matter can i say wow these matter one keep your emotions even when they're absent or when they're present keep your emotions even helicopter supervisors want you panicked so that they can displace all their blame and their responsibility on to you and indeed everybody else <laughs> except themselves. So David Christie in his book Proof of Vipers, which I recommend to you, demonstrated the value of not responding to shouting or anger or abuse with shouting and anger and abuse. One of the reasons we're doing this series, to be frank, is that so you can recognise these types of supervisors. You can also recognise these types of bosses. And once you've recognised them, okay, that person is a helicopter. Once the label is accurate, you can then know what to expect. So you can then expect neglect and you can expect that when they are found out for that neglect, there are going to be tears, there's going to be rage, there's going to be anger and blame. And therefore, the best way to manage and indeed confuse a helicopter is to not buy into their reality. To so say, yep, helicopter, this is a chaos, this is a mess, this is a trauma. Let's not buy into that reality. Let's actually live a real life. So this means you commit to first principles. 
you commit to researching a project evenly and carefully and respectfully. Pretend that your supervisor is present and active, and I'll give you a strategy to activate that pretending in my next tip. But what I want you to do is keep consistent, even when they are in neglect mode, and then expect this helicopter to arrive suddenly, unexpectedly, and at the point you expect that person to arrive to create chaos, I need you this is important. I need you to be emotionally even in response to the chaos. So remember, they want chaos so they can displace blame. Do not let them do that. Do not let them do that. Now, I have a great example of this. I have a few, but probably the best example I can give you is when I was a head of school and I had a helicopter dean. Wow. So I was based in a country town. I'd changed countries and I lived in this country town where the university was at, but this particular dean never actually moved to the country town. She stayed in the capital city. So she was absent a lot of the time. And even when she was there, she actually had no idea what she was doing. She was pretty useless. And what had happened is she had been displaced from her previous role and then applied for the dean post, okay? Now, only two people applied. Both were shortlisted. One person pulled out during the shortlisting process before the interviews, and this particular person became the dean. <laughs> so that's how she became dean, and she had a series of problems. She confused meetings with work, and she confused talking with making changes. And I always remember, and it was a fascinating dynamic to watch. I'm glad I experienced it reasonably early in my career. And I always remember she had instructed me to do something in a meeting. It was minuted in the whole box and dice. She instructed me to do something. And I had actioned the behavior that she'd asked me to do. And she was absolutely disgusted that I'd taken the initiative. She'd forgotten that she'd asked me to do it. Now, she wasn't very bright and she forgot a lot. But before the big head of school meeting that was held once a week, before the head of school meeting, in front of the other heads of school and in front of the full deanery, so all the wonderful administrative staff in the deanery, she shouted at me for a full five minutes, you know, with the spit coming and the whole box and dice, she shouted at me for five minutes, loud, aggressive, nasty. Now, thank, and because I'm complaining that I'd, I'd done this job that she'd asked me to do and forgotten that she'd asked me to do it. Now, because thankfully I've worked in a lot of toxic and dreadful environments, I simply was able to maintain her gaze, remain even, and listen as this abuse was coming at me, so absorb it, if you will. And when she exhausted herself to the point where her voice was raw from the shouting, I thanked her for her feedback and I walked into the room and sat down. Now, she was stunned, she was blustered, she was blushing and ran this meeting worse than she used to run meetings and that's saying something. But what was amazing is as the meeting started, in the action items was listed that I was to undertake this task uh, and that was the task that she'd screamed at me for doing before the meeting started. So we all saw that, all the heads of school saw that and went, wow. So at the conclusion of the meeting, the brother heads of school phoned me and uh, expressed their horror. They said they'd never seen anything like this and that the Dean had called them and said, Tara didn't give me any response. She wasn't angry. I was expecting anger in response. Why wasn't she angry? Now, of course, I've learned to just absorb people's extreme emotions and just get on with the rest of your life. And by the way, the story has a real kicker of an ending. This woman was promoted into senior management, into the chancery in a university when somebody left, so an internal appointment, and she was so incompetent that accreditation was lost over, over a series of courses at that university. Okay, so that's why it's really important 
that you recognize the helicopter and know, you have to know, that at some point they are going to fly off the handle, they are going to throw acid at your face. So you have to prepare yourself to take that reaction, absorb it, and not respond in kind. Manage the fear and know that the anger will come. Put another way, do not participate in their drama, okay? This is not, you're a PhD student, this is not like Brooke and Ridge and you're not an audience for Bold and the Beautiful, okay? You are enrolled in a degree. You're not enrolled in a soap opera. Two, yep, yeah, crucial. Organize weekly meetings with an agenda and an aim. Now, there's some pretty dreadful cliches circling around management culture at the moment. The one that makes me want to scream like I have been attacked by werewolves is manage up. Yuck. So manage up refers to having a completely incompetent boss and you need to get them organized because they can't organize themselves. Okay. So dreadful, like why wouldn't you have performance management, you know, like if you're working for a toddler, how about you address the toddler rather than manage up? But anyway, we can pinch a little bit of content, a little bit of strategy from this mantra, and this is the second way to manage helicopters. The problem with helicopters is that they're absent most of the time, and then they fly in in a panic and un unexpectedly. Therefore, once you've discovered and gone, yep, helicopter, what I need you to do is organize weekly meetings. Now the gift of a Microsoft calendar, and trust me that's a phrase I never ever thought I'd speak. The gift of a Microsoft calendar is that you, a human, can send invitations to your supervisor. So send weekly invitations and with an agenda and with an aim or a goal to achieve at the conclusion of that meeting. Now this system has many advantages. Firstly, your helicopter may be inexperienced. They may not know how to supervise. They may not know that they're doing anything wrong. So what you're doing is you're providing the structure to help them <laughs> to teach them to be a better supervisor. So that's the positive scenario. And the other gift of the weekly meetings is it creates a strategy for evenness. So if they appear, even if they're just sort of pretending interest, they are there and that provides a structure for continuity, right? Now, there is another great strength in constructing these calendar invitations if they don't turn up. Now, you need to recognize they probably won't turn up. And then you've got a record of all the meetings that they've missed. So when that helicopter does finally land and they're creating chaos and blame for you, for something that you've done or not done, you've got the record of the 5, 10, 15, 20 meetings that they missed. So to use my example, in my master's degree, my supervisor missed every meeting for two years. Yes, you heard correctly, they didn't actually come to any meeting in the entire candidature. And I handed in the thesis without anybody having read it, no supervisor had read it, and indeed the supervisor hadn't even signed off the submission. Now these days, you'll have a record of those absences and you can report them. So when the helicopter, and it is when, when the helicopter attempts to throw you under a bus, you have a list of all the meetings and all the agendas that they did not attend and the discussions they did not participate in. Well, three, oh yeah. Recognize that helicopter supervisors often fabricate their expertise. Now David Christie's work on vipers in the workplace has shown that the reason why helicopters are absent is because they fabricate their expertise. They've over-edged their competence, 
and their knowledge. So helicopters are frightened of being found out that they've fabricated their career. Therefore, when you're selecting a supervisor, and even if you're in a situation now, do it now. If you're selecting a supervisor, you do a proper check. You get a sight of those qualifications. You look carefully and read those publications. You verify, you triangulate experience and expertise. Now, no one should be offended that you're having to verify somebody's qualifications, experience and expertise. No one should be offended at that. And of course, there's so many sites for you to do that now. Google Scholar, academia.edu, on and on we go. You have multiple nodes of verification. Therefore, check the person is who they say they are before you take them on as a supervisor. The helicopter strategy is one that is used by managers and supervisors who do not know what they are doing and are rarely confronted by their incompetence. Helicopters manipulate, helicopters con. There's no remorse, there's no guilt, so you check, you verify, you assess. You are a great researcher, so make sure that you research your future or current supervisor. Check they are who they say they are. Look for evidence. Four. Know that you are going to have to be the grown-up and take responsibility. If you have a helicopter supervisor, they will be childish, they will be childlike, angry, shouting, name-calling, blame. Okay, so the consequences of the helicopter behaviour, as reported by Gabriella Molina amidst the COVID lockdown, and of course, COVID lockdown really showed the helicopters, yeah? So in response to COVID, what happened in workplaces? High absenteeism, low productivity, and at the end of COVID, the great resignation. So if you have realized, perhaps in response to this post, that you have a helicopter supervisor, you have a helicopter advisor, Know that you are going to have to take charge of this candidature. You're going to have to find expertise and support beyond your supervisor. And look, try and add a strong co-supervisor to your team. And look, they may not be an expert in your discipline or your field. The co-supervisor in this case may simply be a grown-up, somebody who is emotionally even and competent, That'll do. So do not expect the helicopter supervisor to care or to show any interest in your project. So you need to be confident, competent, a self-starter, self-motivated, and most importantly, you need to be a great researcher. This is crucial. You need to verify your methods. You need to check and check and check again your data collection and your data analysis, and know that your supervisor will not be able to assist you, that they can't or won't check your data set. Remember that most helicopters are discovered when their student makes an error and peer reviewers in a journal pick up the problem. So therefore, educate yourself and work with great colleagues, work with co-supervisors, because your helicopter supervisor is not going to help you find those errors. Five, oh yeah, log everything. Good note taking is crucial with a helicopter supervisor. Now I know I've been frightening during this post, but I am trying to protect you. I've seen this, I've seen people's lives destroyed by helicopter supervisors and helicopter bosses. So I'm being really straight up today. Know that some of the most serious research misconduct cases I have seen, some of the most serious research misconduct cases I have investigated have been caused by helicopter supervisors.
So you will need to stop yourself, protect yourself from being blamed for this situation. Therefore, organize your meetings, organize your agendas, send follow-up emails saying something like, so sorry you couldn't make it to the meeting, so sorry that the supervisor didn't appear. So send the messages, send the data sets, send your data analysis, send those emails out, even if the emails are not replied to, because if there is an investigation, then you will need evidence that you behaved ethically and well, and that the helicopter supervisor dropped the ball. So imagine someone like me, imagine an investigator involved in a research misconduct case. Now, when we do these cases, I need evidence. I need evidence of what you've done, what every other person has done. Not talking, not gonna, coulda, shoulda, not, oh, I did this. I require evidence. So if you have emails and meeting requests, that is excellent evidence to show that you've done the best that you can and that your supervisor caused these situations and these problems. Also, if you need a reason to change supervisors, if you've got this type of material for two, three, six months, that's all the information you need to show you need a proper supervisor. Remember, record keeping in research and record keeping in supervision really, really matters. So keep good records, file evidence. Okay, now I know I've been pretty staunch this week. I've been very negative about the helicopter supervisor and there are reasons for that. I, I'm frightened for you, I'm frightened for our universities to be frank. But also know there are alternative analyses, interpretations of the situation. I know Bill's story configured a much more benevolent rendering of helicopter management. He argued that the managers at 35,000 feet are out of touch and completely disconnected. The managers on ground level are, are micromanaging too much attention. So he argued that the helicopter supervisor and manager is about right. They're looking to the future, but they're seeing the wider vista of your behavior. So that's an interesting argument. It's in the reference list for you at the conclusion of this post, if that's something you want to look at further. But the key for me with helicopter supervision is we need to break this cycle because helicopter supervisors create helicopter supervisors. And can I say also helicopter leaders create other helicopter leaders. Recognize the helicopter, recognize that Consistency, evenness, engagement, and predictability are the gifts that we give ourselves and the gifts we certainly give to the people around us. Consistency and predictability are important in a PhD program, in a workplace, and yes, in life. It is time that we ground that helicopter and we get on the land and we walk with people rather than shout at them. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.